Oh, hey everyone. I didn't see you there. I was just doing some bicep curls with my tin of chickpeas. Anyway, welcome to uh, Imperial Lates. This is our online late series for adults. This is our health and fitness edition quiz. So Imperial Lates, if you don't know much about us, across the week, across one week each month, we explore a different theme with science and engineering researchers from Imperial. This one is part of well-being. It's the last event from this week. Uh, we had some awesome things earlier um, in the week, all about well-being and quite a bit about sleeping. So if you're interested, you can check it out on our website. If you search in your preferred search engine for Imperial Lates. Now, our quiz is quite unique because we center our questions and our themes around research that is currently happening at Imperial. Now, you're very lucky that I have two researchers with me tonight. Uh, they work on gamification and uh, motivating patients to get active. Uh, so we will have a bit of time at the halfway point to chat to them, but let's just bring them in and give a bit of a wave. Hello, this is Michelle. This is Renera. We'll be seeing them a bit later in round two, but you've got me for the first 10, 15 minutes of the quiz. We'll see you guys in a bit. So, as I said, welcome to the Publis Quiz, Health and Fitness Edition. Um, if there is uh, a problem, uh, either I, if I'm still here, or one of my colleagues will put this slide up, which says that we are having some technical issues, but please grab a drink and stay with us. Um, if there's anything else worse going on, um, either I or one of my colleagues will pop up on screen and tell you what is happening. So, um, before we get into round one, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. If you've done a quiz before ever in your life, you will already know these. But let me quickly say, um, we would love you to use the chat. You know, I love to chat and we're gonna have to have a chat with our researchers later. So if you've got any fun comments um, that aren't the correct answers during the quiz, then please put them in there. Um, I've got two of my colleagues in the background moderating the chat. Please don't be too inappropriate. There's a certain level of inappropriateness that is acceptable. I think we should all know the difference as responsible adults. Uh, no cheating is another point. Um, there's no prize for this quiz, so there's really no incentive to cheat. You're only cheating yourselves, and it's more fun if you don't. You will be marking your own quizzes. So. Uh, at the end of each round, I will be giving out the answers so that you don't have to think too far back about what happened. So I'll do round one, then I'll give the answers to round one, then round two, answers to round two. Top up your scores um, as you finish each round. And just before the final round, uh, we'll be sending out a link in the chat to, the, to a form where you will say what your scores were for each one. And then the final round, the speed round, will be marked by us. It will be well, actually auto-marked. So you will have to click on that link, write in your scores for the previous rounds, and you will be able to select A, B, and C for each question in our speed round. A bit more about that when we get to it. Um, please choose a team name. That is what you normally do in quizzes. You may have your team with you, um, or maybe they are remote. Um, I would advise, if you haven't already, set up a WhatsApp group or a conference call, if that's more your style so that you can discuss answers with them. You will have two minutes at the end of each round, apart from the speed round, to discuss your answers and agree. I think that is about everything. If there is something I've forgotten, I will say it in the middle of other things. But yes, please talk to us in the chat. No correct answers, but lots of funny things. Okay, everyone, let's crack on with general knowledge. Question one, what does BMI stand for? So this is question one. Hopefully not too difficult, want to ease you in. Question one, what does BMI stand for? And there's one point for this question. Question two, 
According to the BBC's Truth About Healthy Eating documentary, what is the most hydrating drink? Put some icons there, but that is neither to hint or to discourage. They're just icons. That's question two. According to the BBC's Truth About Healthy Eating documentary, what is the most hydrating drink? And please do not post any answers in the chat. Keep them to yourselves. We will be marking the answers at the end of this round. Question three. We've all seen yoga take the fitness world by storm. But what does the word yoga actually mean? Bit of niche knowledge here. So that's question three. We've all seen yoga take the fitness world by storm. But what does the word yoga actually mean? I did not know this before I looked. So I think it probably is quite a tricky question, but I'm interested to know. Question four. It's a two point to this one. Two points to this question. Monitoring our blood pressure is important for our health. It is measured with two figures, for example, 140 over 90. What are the terms for the upper and the lower numbers? So you get two points. One, if you can tell me the term for the upper number, and a point if you, can, if you can tell me the word for the lower number. I tested this question out on my nurse friends and they got it. So hopefully you got one of them in your team. They know their stuff. This is question four. Monitoring our blood pressure is important for our health. It is measured with two figures, for example, 140 over 90. What are the terms for the upper and lower numbers? Question five, a bit about gaming here. The Nintendo Wii is a hugely popular home video game that gets you up and moving around while you play. I want to know in what year was the Wii released, the original Nintendo Wii? Was it A, 2005? Was it B, 2006? Or C, 2007? That's question five. The Nintendo Wii is a hugely popular home video game that gets you up and moving around while you play. In what year was the Wii released? Was it A, 2005, B, 2006, or C, 2007? Okay, question six. In Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, the character of Shylock demanded a pound of flesh as payment. However, if he had demanded that the subject burn off a pound of flesh instead, how many calories would they need to burn? I'm afraid there's no advantage to knowing Shakespeare, this question. It is a health and fitness quiz. Not a Shakespeare quiz. Question six. In Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, Shylock demanded a pound of flesh as payment. So a pound of flesh. However, if he had demanded that the subject burn off the pound of flesh instead, how many calories would they need to burn?
Who's that character that he demands the pound of flesh on? Any any thoughts? Any Shakespeare buffs in the audience? I should know this, but I can't remember. Antonio? No. Some some something yo. <laughs> okay, question seven. For the yogis out there, question seven. What yoga pose is this? Is it A, the slug pose? Is it B, the snail pose? Or is it C, the caterpillar pose? Maybe you want to really get into character, try out the pose. What does that make you feel like? Slug, snail, caterpillar. That's question seven. What yoga pose is this? Is it A, the slug pose? B, the snail pose? Or C, the caterpillar pose? Question eight. The Olympics celebrate the world's best athletes. Now, I don't know if you remember, but there was controversy a few years ago when South African athlete Castor Semenya was banned from competing in the 800 meters. Why was she banned? So the question there is why was she banned from running the 800 meters? I think she was a double, uh, double gold medalist. That's question eight. There was controversy in the Olympics, when South African athlete Castor Semenya was banned from competing in the 800 meters. I want you to tell me why was she banned? You don't have to have anything word for word, as long as you get the sense of it, then you can have the point. Question nine. Lots of people stay fit by joining and, quite importantly, going to a gym. There are a huge range of memberships that you can get. But in what country would you find the most expensive gym membership? Is it A, in Serbia? Is it B, in the United States of America? Or C, India? So I want to know for question nine, in what country would you find the most expensive gym membership? Is it A, Serbia, B, the United States of America, or C, India? And finally, question 10. Now we've talked a lot about physical health but you can also do exercises for your brain. This is more the kind of exercises that I do. One of the most famous types of puzzle is the crossword. I want to know in what year was the first crossword published? Was it A, 1913? Is it B, 1934? Or is it C, 1943? And in the, on the slide there, you can see the image of a crossword. That is, in fact, the first crossword ever published. That was the original crossword. But in what year was it published? Was it A, 1913? Is it B, 1934? Was it C, 19? 43. Now you have two minutes from the moment I click to the next slide. Two minutes to discuss with your teammates who are either next to you or maybe they are isolating elsewhere. Two minutes and then I'll come back and we will mark your scores. Go.
Okay, everyone, that is just coming up to the end of your two minutes. So just in case anyone's unsure about how you uh, mark and submit your scores, what I want you to do is mark it just as you would a normal quiz. I'll give you the answers now and at the end of each round. But just before the final round, we're going to put a link in the YouTube chat that will take you to a form where you'll put in your team name, your score for round one, score for round two, and score for round three. And then you will click next, and that will take you to the final round, round four, which is our speed round. You answer the questions in there, you click submit, and then it will all come to us and it will magically turn into a scoreboard, which we will share with you to announce the winner. So all you need to think about right now is just keep track of your scores in each round, which we'll ask you for later. Okay, everyone, time is up. So let's do these answers. And I would love to hear from you in the chat. Um, we're going to pop you up on screen if you say anything really cool or very funny. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So round one, I asked you, what does BMI stand for? One point for this. It stands for body mass index. So hopefully all of you got that. Uh, body mass index is a measure that people uh, use. It's their height and their weight that they use to work out if you are healthy. For anyone who would like to know, uh, the formula is uh, your weight in kilograms divided by your height squared. Anyone want to know? Question two, according to the BBC's Truth About Healthy Eating, what is the most hydrating drink? It is, in fact, milk. Milk is also amazing for things that are spicy. Uh, but milk is, apparently, the most hydrating drink probably because of high levels of electrolytes, sugar, calcium, protein, lots more stuff in it than water. So this is, this is probably why. But milk, when I found the answer out to this, I drank myself a glass of milk and I did feel very refreshed. My sister keeps telling me to shut up about milk. Question three, we've all see, seen the yoga. We've all seen the yoga. You've seen yoga, take the fitness world by storm. Did anyone actually know what the word yoga meant? Did anyone get this? The answer is union. It's union. Yes, I would love to know if anyone got that right. Did anyone want to make a good, a good guess at what yoga means? Maybe you were a bit close, but I will only accept the answer union. That is all. Question four. Uh, I want to know the terms for the upper and lower numbers uh, when measuring your blood pressure. So there's two points for this. Uh, so one point if you got systolic pressure, that's the upper number, and one point if you got diastolic pressure, that's the lower number. So it's two points available there. One point for systolic, one point for diastolic. Okie dokie. Question five. I want to know in what year the Nintendo Wii was originally released. It was 2006. I know I wasn't very kind there putting the answers just a year apart. I don't want to be too obvious. I want to patronize you. Uh, if anyone really wants to know, it was specifically November the 19th, 2006. Question six. If Shylock in Merchant of Venice had demanded that the subject burned off a pound of flesh instead of giving it to him, how many calories would they need to burn? The answer to this is 3,500 calories. So people often use this calorie model to lose weight. They create a deficit in their diet of 3,500 calories so that they can lose a pound. Very clever. That would have probably changed the ending of the Merchant of Venice. Question seven, I want to know what yoga pose is this? So I can tell you the correct answer is the snail pose. That's B, the snail pose. It's also known as the plow pose. Um, the caterpillar pose uh, is an actual pose, but it's not this one. And the slug pose is not a pose at all. I made that one up. So the answer to this one, B, the snail pose. Question eight, I wanted to know why the South African athlete Castor Semenya was banned. So she was banned because the um, world, oh, what were they called? The, oh, oh yes, World Athletics said that her testosterone levels were too high, uh, that she's 
biologically male. Um, so Semenya and other female athletes uh, with naturally high testosterone were barred from races that were between 400 meters and one mile, um, unless they, went un they underwent treatment for their hormone levels for six months prior to running. So one thing that Semenya is doing instead is she is training for the 200 meters because this testosterone level rule doesn't apply to distances under 400 meters. Or she could do like the marathon. That's quite interesting. Uh, this is called DSD, if you want to know. It's the Differences of Sex Development Condition. So yes, yeah, so if you've got anything in the region of, um, they said that she was biologically male. Uh, yeah, hormones. I think specifically I would need to know that it was testosterone. So yes, give yourself a point for that. So this is the world's most expensive gym. Um, so I wanted to know in what country would you find the most expensive gym membership? It might surprise you to know that it is Serbia. I seem to have just completely drowned out the answers with this gi these giant pictures of, of gyms. Uh, but out of Serbia, the United States of America and India, the most expensive gym is actually in Serbia. So it's this one here that you can see in this lovely picture. It, this is the Wellness Sky Gym in Belgrade. It is 1,100 meters squared with an average membership cost of 30,000 pounds a year. 30,000 uh, pounds. The most expensive gym in America is $30,000. So it works out a little bit less, that's in Arizona. And funnily enough, even though um, USA and Serbia have the most expensive gym memberships, neither of them are on the list for healthiest countries in the world in like the top 30. Neither of them are in the top 30. Um, I mean, I pay 20 pound a month for a gym. That kind of does me. And finally, question 10. I wanted to know when the first crossword puzzle was published. It was as early as 1913. Uh, it first ran in the New York World newspaper on the 21st of December, 1913. And it was created by a journalist named Arthur Wynne from Liverpool. Uh, one of the clues in this, and you can have a little search online and see if you can actually do the answers for this. But one of the clues was, what is this puzzle? And the answer to that was a four letter word, hard. So everyone, top your, uh, your answers. Um, the scores to your answers. Jot it down because we'll be asking you later. Um, and now we're going to do our research around. So uh, you saw them for a split second at the start of the quiz, but let's meet them properly. So uh, our researchers are, I'm going to get rid of this PowerPoint so you can see them lovely. Hello. So our first uh, researcher that I'm going to allow to introduce herself is Renera. Uh, hello, Renera. Tell us a bit about who you are. Hi. So, yeah, I'm Renera and I'm a PhD student currently at Imperial. I have a background in neuroscience and I'm currently working on developing an AI-based wearable that will help people with lower back pain to perform uh, their physiotherapy and exercise from home using gamification. That is super cool. Uh, and a bit more about that later. If you're uh, um, interested in learning anything more about uh, the research of these guys, uh, send us questions in the chat. They'll be passed on to me and we can ask them at half time, which will be after this round. Uh, so our second guest, who is not Michelle, was actually meant to be Lisa, uh, but unfortunately, after helping write this quiz, she has no voice whatsoever and is unwell. So I've told her not to put herself at the mercy of a YouTube audience tonight. Uh, she is sitting quietly and cosily in the background, and uh, if she can offer any expertise on topics that I know nothing about, she will be doing that. She has written uh, four quiz questions for you, for which I will be the voice. Uh, and Lisa's main research is on developing software to assess motivation to self-train. So she's part of a team who are developing the first online social network of collaborative gaming exercises. And that will be used online uh, and with bedside motor with the rehabilitation. I hope I did you justice, Lisa. And finally, we have Michelle. Who are you, Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm an occupational therapist by background. I normally work in a hospital with people after they've had a stroke. 
Um, and I'm now in the second year of my PhD and I actually work on the same project as Lisa, looking at how technology and gaming systems can be used to help stroke survivors recover after stroke, so in physical rehabilitation. Awesome, thank you, Michelle. Okay, so we're gonna, um, you're gonna join me in turn for the questions that you have written. So uh, Renera has written questions one to four, uh, Lisa has written five to eight, and Michelle has written nine to 12. So we'll be seeing you in a bit, Michelle, but Renera is with me first. So, um, yes, let's get you on, on the top because you're the most important person. So, uh, take it away, Renera. All right, so question one, um, how many muscles are there in the back? Is it A, three, B, 12, C, 56, or D, 120? I'll just repeat that again. So how many muscles are there in the back? Is it A3, B12, C56, or D120? I think I said this in the run through, uh, Renera, that I, I thought that B12 was a band, but actually it's a vitamin. And one of my colleagues corrected me and said that it's, it's D12, that's the band, that's the... I think Eminem was in that, and something to do with being in D Detroit. You never heard of D12? Uh, they've got an excellent song, the only one I know called My Band. Uh, okay, sorry, please continue. <laughs> right, uh, question two. So when we normally speak of the abs, which muscles are we referring to? Is it A, rectus abdominis, B, transversus abdominis, C, triassic abdominis, or D, rectus absinth? And just one more time. So when we normally speak of the abs, which muscles are we referring to? Is it A, rectus abdominis, B, transversus abdominis, C, triassic abdominis, or D, rectus absinth? And now for question three. So which of these, which athlete who suffered from back pain due to scoliosis, which is actually the sideways curvature in the spine, said, if I keep my core and back strong, the scoliosis doesn't really bother me. Is it A, Donald Trump, B, Usain Bolt, C, Justin Gatlin, or D, Harry Kane? And one more time. So which athlete who suffered from back pain due to scoliosis, which is a sideways curvature in the spine, said, if I keep my core, core and back strong, the scoliosis doesn't really bother me? Is it A, Donald Trump, B, Usain Bolt, C, Justin Gatlin, or D, Harry Kane? And I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure one of those isn't actually an athlete at all. I'm not sure which one, but... My surprise senses are tingling. <laughs> okay. So lastly, question four. In the show House, Dr. Gregory House suffers from chronic back pain in his leg. As a result, he becomes addicted to Vicodin, an opioid-based medication. Is the following statement true or false? Around 80% of heroin users in the US first started off misusing prescription opioids. And lastly, I'll repeat that again. In the show House, Dr. Gregory House suffers from chronic, back pa chronic pain in his leg. As a result, he becomes addicted to Vicodin, an opioid-based medication. Is the following statement true or false? Around 80% of heroin users in the US first started off misusing prescription opioids. Thank you very much for your brilliantly written questions, Anera. So we will be seeing you later when you give us the answers and a bit of insight into why the answer is what it is. So uh, next we would have Lisa, um, for whom I will be, I will be representing. So hi, I'm Lisa. Um, question five. So all of these were written by Lisa. I hope I do you justice. Question five, what would be the first approach that a healthcare professional would use to motivate their patients within a rehabilitation setting? Is it A, games, B, goal setting, C, dance, or D, 
speech therapy. Question five, what would be the first approach that a healthcare professional would use to motivate their patients within a rehabilitation setting? Is it A, games, B, goal setting, C, dance, or D, speech therapy? Okay, question six. Uh, US business magazine Fast Company named neuroscientist Tej Taddy, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong, um, Lisa, uh, as one of the most creative people in business in 2018. He used virtual reality in stroke treatment. Can you tell me the name of his medical startup company? It was A, We Sports, B, Mind Maze, C, Calm, or D, connect games. So question six, US business magazine, Fast Company, not one that I personally read, but maybe there are people out there who do. Uh, they named neuroscientist Tej Taddy as one of the most creative people in business in 2018. What was his medical startup company? Was it A, We Sports, B, Mind Maze, C, calm, or D, connect games. I hope you're all chatting away nicely in the chat. I'd like there to be a bit of atmosphere. I can't see it, uh, but I, I hope that it's, it's a good laugh. And you're learning a lot. Question seven, which Hollywood actor's father survived a stroke in 1996. I'll give you a hint. The actor in question starred in Fatal Attraction and A Perfect Murder. So whose dad survived a stroke in 1996? Was it A, Charlie Sheen's dad? Is it B, Michael Douglas's dad? C, Brandon Lee's dad? Or D, Colin Hanks's dad? That's question seven. I want to know which Hollywood actor's father survived a stroke in 1996. A, Charlie Sheen. B, Michael Douglas. C, Brandon Lee. Or D, Colin Hanks. And the final question from Lisa, a bit about gaming apps. So question eight. I want you to name the game app released in 2010 that requires the user to slice various objects on screen, which later research showed improved scores in limb strength and motor function for stroke patients. So what's the name of this app? Was it A, Candy Crush, B, Fruit Ninja, C, Cooking Fever, or D, Pokemon Go? Who knew that an app would be so awesome in rehabilitation? Something that we're going to talk about later with our researchers. That's question eight. I want you to name the game app released in 2010 that requires the user to slice various objects on screen, which later research showed improved scores in limb strength and motor function for stroke patients. Is it A, Candy Crush, B, Fruit Ninja, C, Cooking Fever, or D, Pokemon Go. And now we bring back Michelle to deliver her questions. Welcome back, Michelle. Thank you. Take it away. Um, so question nine, BBC presenter Andrew Marr had a stroke aged just 53 that almost killed him. For stroke survivors like Andrew, it's common to experience residual weakness on one side of the body. Why is this? Is it A, people often suffer a fall or traumatic injury at the time of the stroke? Is it B, the muscles on one side of the body no longer receive nutrients from the brain? Or C, the part of the brain affected by the stroke stops sending messages to the body? So for stroke survivors, it is common to experience residual weakness on one side of the body. Why is this? Is it A, because people suffer a fall or traumatic injury at the time of the stroke? B, 
because the muscles on one side of the body no longer receive nutrients from the brain, or C, the part of the brain affected by the stroke stops sending messages to the body. Question 10. In the animated film, Inside Out, the team managing the brain get a new marble every time something new is learned. But can the brain change or grow after childhood and adolescence? A, no, we learn and develop all of our basic skills in childhood. B, yes, when the brain is injured, it responds by growing cells and reshaping its functions. Or C, yes, the brain changes regularly throughout a person's life. So the question again, can the brain change or grow after childhood and adolescence? Is it A, no, we learn and develop all of our skills in childhood. B, yes, when the brain is injured, it responds by growing cells and reshaping its functions. Or C, yes, the brain changes regularly throughout a person's life. I love that film and that little person there. That's that's joy. That's joy. She's wonderful. Question eleven. It is often said that practice practice makes perfect. We've all heard of the ten thousand hour rule. After brain injury, how many repetitions of an arm movement does a person need to do each day to prompt brain recovery and make meaningful improvements in arm movement? Is it A, 15 to 30 repetitions a day, B, 50 to 100, or C, 300 to 500 repetitions each day? So the question again, after brain injury, how many repetitions of an arm movement does a person need to do each day to prompt brain recovery and make improvements in arm function? Is it A, 15 to 30, B, 50 to 100, or C, 300 to 500 daily repetitions. And finally, question 12. Smoke and mirrors are often used in the context of illusion and deception. Mirror therapy is a rehabilitation therapy in which the affected limb is placed inside a concealed mirror box, thus reflecting the movement of the non-affected limb outside of the box. Why might therapists use this with stroke survivors? Is it A, because it improves their mood by tricking them into thinking they still have normal movement in that arm? B, it has no effect at all, it's just a myth. Or C, it helps improve movement by re and reduces pain in the limb. So again, mirror therapy is a rehabilitation therapy in which the affected limb, usually the arm, is placed inside a concealed mirror box. And so then the unaffected limb is reflected on the mirror box. Why might therapists use this technique? Is it A, because it improves patients' mood, tricking them into thinking they still have normal movement? Is it B, that actually it, it has no, no effect at all, it's just a myth? Or C, it improves movement and reduces pain in the arm? Got some tricky questions from you, Michelle. Let's weed out the strong from the weak in the quiz. Okay, so you're going to get two minutes, everyone, just like the first one, to confer with your team. We'll see you in two minutes for the answers.
Hey everyone. Okay, I hope that you have got your answers ready. Um, again, just like with round one, uh, I need you to jot down uh, your answers, the marks that you've got for the answers, and we'll need you to submit them at the end to us. And please try and refrain from cheating because it just makes it annoying for the people who didn't cheat. So let's bring back uh, Renera and Michelle so they can help me deliver the answers because they're going to give a bit of information as well about you know why the answer is what it is uh, and also if you've got any questions uh, about anything our researchers are doing send them in uh, for our Q&A after these answers so uh, Renera is your round so uh, remind us of the question and tell us the answer so yeah first question was how many muscles are there in the back and the answer is in fact 120 well over 120 there are also around 220 ligaments in the back, which are like the membranes that connect bones to other bones. And you have 33 vertebrae that go make up the actual spine, the bones, vertebra. And this is actually what allows us to be so flexible and move in so many different directions. Yeah. Wow. That kind of, that's probably why things can go so wrong, I guess. There's like loads, uh, yeah, of, loads of little bits. <laughs> Explains a lot. Um, actually, surprisingly, um, around 80% of the population do suffer from some sort of back pain in their lifetime. So, I definitely have. I already have too. <laughs> um, for question two, so I asked you, when we normally speak about abs, which muscles are we actually referring to? And the answer is the rectus abdominis. Um, yeah, so your core muscles are actually really highly important to maintaining a healthy spine and um, preventing injury. And people think that, you know, building a six pack is what what defines you as strong or healthy. But it's not actually the fact that sit ups alone can help you. Um, your core consists of so many different muscles. There's actually three different layers of muscles on your stomach alone with the abs, the rectus abdominis being the first one. Um, I, quite, I quite like to triassic abdominus is that like dinosaur abdomen tried to, yeah i tried to check you just made that up didn't you <laughs> yeah triassic period and absent as well if absent anyone is not it's not a muscle okay cool oh and question three so i asked which athlete who suffered from back pain due to scoliosis uh, said the quote if i keep my core and back strong the scoliosis doesn't but really bother me the answer is in fact usain bolt legend um, so he's been suffering from that for a long time and essentially what it is is something that shows up mainly when you're a child and going through growth spurts uh, where your spine has a curvature uh, grows with a curvature and a lot of these conditions the reason behind it is remains unknown um, and actually 70 to 80 percent of all back pain problems there is no known cause however there are so many different studies showing that if you can um, stay active and improve and treat this kind of pain. Very nice. Yeah. And question four. So in the show House, Dr. Gregory House suffers from chronic pain in his leg. Um, and I asked about whether the following statement was true or false. Around 80% of heroin users in the US first started off misusing prescription opioids. And the actual answer is true. Um, Opioids is a class of drugs that derive from the opium poppy, and poppy plant, and this includes heroin. And prescription opiums are usually given to treat severe chronic pain. Um, in the 1990s, a lot of healthcare providers started prescribing this for pain in the US, and this really led to a widespread misuse of it before it actually became a public health emergency in 2017. Wow. So now we're trying to wean off trying to prescribe this because of the fact a lot of people get addict addicted to it and start and start going into heroin after they come off their prescriptions yikes so is so so in heroin is part of this there has a bit of opium so opium is the is the thing is it um yeah opium is the plant so opium plant but oh, um, plant. yeah and heroin is a type of opioid which is the class of drugs so they all work right. in the same, same way Oh, wow. Morphine as well, um, which some people might know of. Um, that's also an opioid. Great. So if any, any questions about drugs uh, in the chat, we can just pass on to Renera, put in the Q&A, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, question five. So I'm going to give the answers for Lisa's um, round, but please pitch in Michelle um, and Renera because I'm not an expert on any of these things. So um, what to know for question five, what would be the first approach that you would use to motivate your patient in rehabilitation setting? So um, all of these are technically viable, um, but the answer that they're looking for that we first use is goal setting. So yeah, you could use all of those things. They would have potential to be good uh, motivating a person, but goal setting is often used with exercise and rehabilitation programs. Uh, there was a study um, by Suzuki in 2020, is that right, uh, guys? Do you know about this study? Um, which uses strategies to motivate patients to meet exercises by simple goals. So they just wanna provide like an enjoyable exercise program to communicate well and provide a lot of feedback. So self-motivation is critical um, and strongly associated with functional and motor improvement. Um, so the, I think that they're, you're trying to like do more gamification so that you can do self-directed therapy. So that's like robotics, wearing sensors uh, and these gaming apps, uh, which I would love to hear more about in a bit. Uh, question six. So I want to know what was the name of this medical startup company that this guy... Um, did, uh, that named him one of the most creative people in business in 2018. So his startup company was Mind Maze. Now I haven't heard of this one, um, but I'm told that uh, this is a neuro rehabilitation company. And this uses VR and neuroscience to repair broken connections in the brain mm -hmm. and retrain the body after a stroke. So it like retrains you to move. Um, so uh, this guy, he found that patients had a lot of trouble motivating themselves. So again, similar to the question before, it's like trying to get people to want to do things. And yeah, personally, if I was given a game, uh, that would definitely make me want to do more things. Probably why the, the Nintendo Wii was so popular. Question seven, want to know which Hollywood actor's father survived a stroke in 1996? Um, now, all of those guys have famous dads, but the one that we're looking for is Michael Douglas. Uh, so uh, Kirk Douglas is the father of famous Hollywood actor Michael Douglas. So he survived a stroke in 1996 and wrote a memoir uh, detailing his experience called My Stroke of Luck. Quite hilariously named. Um, so it was surprising that after the stroke, he went on to make two films. And he said, I am, uh, he said, I am lucky, although my speech is still impaired, I suffer no paralysis and I didn't die. And he actually... Uh, survived to the age of 103 uh, and only died just in February this year. So had a stroke in 96, lived to be 103. So that is a legend of a guy. And question eight, I want you to name the game app that was released in 2010 where you sliced various objects. And the answer to this is Fruit Ninja. I definitely remember this coming out. You get like a samurai sword and you slash across the across your, your smartphone. So the game allows users to improve uh, abduction, um, uh, extension, rotation, and it requires quite a lot of dexterity because it's timed with the falling fruit. So the difficulty increases uh, as you go on and the fruit falls faster and there's, and there's more things. And what's interesting about this game is that um, there was a study in 2015 that found that using this app with patients um, with subacute stroke for an hour, five times a week, improved their scores on upper limb strength and motor function. So apps, games, fun games for movement is the way forward for me anyway. Okay, so uh, Michelle, your answers, take it away. And so question nine is asking, for stroke survivors, it's common to experience weakness on one side of the body. Why is this? And the answer is actually C, the injured part of the brain stops sending messages and that's nerve signals from the brain to the body. So when a person has a stroke, it's caused by a bleed or a clot in the brain. And the functions associated with that part of the brain then become impaired. So the right side of the brain controls the left side of your body. So when you have an injury or a stroke on the right side of the brain, it, it often leads to weakness on the left side of the body. And Andrew Marr actually made a phenomenal recovery. I'm sure many of you will see him on TV still. Um, but he, like more than 60% of stroke survivors, still suffers weakness on one side of his body. And you can actually see it when he presents his TV show. He sits in a certain way where he supports his arm and kind of moves it. Um, yeah. So yeah, 
is one kind of example but i think it's it's one of the things everyone knows about stroke to identify stroke if you see it there's a really effective campaign called a fast campaign um, yeah. and it's one of the first signs of a stroke having a stroke is is that weakness happening on one side of the face what's um, fast yeah. again is it, is it so is it face face, face arm slur speech and time so face is the, the drooping of the face arm is the weakness or paralysis in the arm speech is a slurring of speech and then time is is to act quick so the time to get to the hospital yeah oh good thing to remember everyone yeah well today is actually um world stroke day yes um, i was i meant to mention that at the beginning because yeah. you told me this earlier yes yeah, so it's, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the, the warning signs for stroke, but also the importance of activity for stroke prevention. So um, the age of stroke is getting younger and younger. So people often think that when people have a stroke, they're old. But actually, two out of three people who have a stroke are under the age of 70 now. And, and we all have a one in four chance in our lifetime of having a stroke. So actually physical activity while we're healthy is one of the key aspects of preventing your risk of having a stroke. That's a really good thing to remember, particularly when we are locked down in our houses, not to yeah. sit around too much, not for the sake yeah. of okay. not getting fat, but also so that we prevent uh, future health problems. That is a scary but good advice. Thank you. Um, so question 10, can the brain change or grow after childhood and at adolescence? So there are actually two correct answers to this, both B and C. So in response to brain injury, processes known as neurogenesis and neuroplasticity happen in the brain. This is the brain's way of essentially restoring and, and healing itself. Um, but beyond this, the brain actually changes every time we learn a new skill, adjust to a change or make a memory. So new learning is thought to be critical to maintaining a healthy brain because every time we're learning, our brain is growing a little bit. Studies actually suggest that exercise can help to prime our brains for learning. So things like um, going out for a run before you do some study or um, in, a, in a stroke context, we would often try and get, get someone's heart rate up before we try learning more specific fine motor skills and things with patients. Nice. Okay. Um, so question 11. How many repetitions of a movement every day does somebody need to do to make a meaningful recovery after a stroke? Um, and this is every day. And I guess bearing in mind, people are often quite tired and have lots of other symptoms after a stroke. They need to be doing 300 to 500 repetitions every day after a stroke to start to see changes. Um, so the brain has a, a unique way of learning or relearning skills when we practice things. This results in actual physical structural changes in the brain and in the biochemistry in the brain. We don't know the exact number of repetitions, but animal studies suggest around three to 500 repetitions are needed. Um, so for stroke survivors who have quite severe weakness and can't do a full movement repetition, even visualizing a movement can start this process of recovery. And so that's one of the most important things that we know right now is, is that essentially move it or lose it after brain injury and stroke movement is so important for recovery. Move it or lose it. Yeah, it's, it's tough but true. Mm. Okay, final question of the round. And, and so question 11 is about mirror therapy, which is kind of a bizarre thing when you see it in practice. If, if anyone um, is interested, I would suggest looking it up on YouTube. So it's when someone actually puts their hand in a box that's surrounded in mirrors, and then it tricks your brain into thinking that your, your weak arm is moving when you move your, your stronger arm. And so the answer to this question is C, that actually it does improve movement and reduce pain after a stroke. So by setting this, uh, this mirror system up, the brain activates different regions for movement, sensation, and pain. So studies show evidence that this is helpful at both increasing someone's strength and movement and also reducing their experience of pain in an arm after brain injury. And um, there's still a lack of consensus as to how this works. So we don't know what mechanisms are happening in the brain um, to, to explain the phenomenon, but um, it's something that's quite often used in practice. Well, thank you so much, uh, guys, for those really awesome questions. And it's so 
so informative. Um, we're going to have uh, a little Q and A now. So this is um, sort of technically just after the the halfway point in the quiz. Although our third and fourth rounds are shorter, uh, so um, we will be doing a little Q and A now. But we understand that you might also need some kind of comfort break or drink refill uh, but please put your questions in contribute as much as you like to the conversation so we're going to be doing this for between five and ten minutes so i'm going to make us full screen so you can get us in all our glory um so uh we do have um a question from the audience but i wanted to ask just first uh like how did you how did you get into into doing this sort of what was so just to ask each of you what was your path into uh, well, stroke research is mainly what you were doing, aren't you, Michelle? Yeah. So, and um, as I was saying, um, when I introduced myself, I work in stroke rehabilitation normally as an occupational therapist, and um, and so my job as an OT involves looking at how different life circumstances change the way we do things every day. So, in the case of a stroke, having having a stroke has has vast consequences for for how someone's memory and cognitive skills work and and how their movement and how their ability to walk and and so that knock-on effect trickles into every aspect of their life so people can't return to work in their normal jobs it affects their relationships with the people around them and their ability to dress themselves and do things and and one of the key aspects of my job is helping people to help themselves so our profession is kind of based around enabling people rather than doing for them. And that's really the key philosophy of rehabilitation and, and successful rehabilitation in the long term. It's helping people to help themselves. And um, so I guess that's a long way around to saying that my research is, is looking at just that, how we can help stroke survivors to do more exercise on their own time, because we know that's what they need to do to make a meaningful recovery in the long term. Um, and so that's how I got into the, the research area I'm in now, I was I was working clinically and asking kind of a lot of questions about how we could improve some aspects of how we were helping patients. Um, and then my supervisor was was looking at the same question. So we've kind of teamed up and, and are part of this project now. What, um, and is your project, uh, I think this is the one that we talk about, is it grippable? Yeah, so it's it's essentially using gaming technology. So similar to Lisa's, um, where you can use social or interactive gaming, so you can um, play kind of like yeah, there it is. Um, you can play, you can play interactive games with other people, like collaboratively or on your own. And um, and the thing is that actually it's quite hard to achieve a lot of repetitive exercise in a hospital environment. So normally in an NHS hospital, patients do a bed. 30 repetitions of movement every day. So of this squeeze and release, for example, which is really important if you want to pick up a glass or brush your teeth, open a door, use your phone. And um, so we do about 30 repetitions of those in, in our therapy exercise classes because there's so many other things we're working on. So leaving a patient with a device like this where they might do 100 repetitions a day gets us much closer to achieving 300 repetitions, which is what we need to, to yeah. make that the recovery. Um, wow. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> for ages of edit, it's a very niche interest. Yeah. Thank you. And um, Renee, just re re remind me of the, your sort of um, the, the main area of what you're doing, so we can so our, to our audience oh. remembers. It's been a while since we did that two uh, two sentence intro. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'm actually working mainly on chronic lower back pain, and we're kind of extending on grippable in the fact that we're using gamification um, and trying to extend that to uh, physiotherapy for people that have back pain so essentially there's kind of studies that show a compliance to perform physiotherapy at home for back pain patients is as low as 30 percent um, and so uh, gaming has been shown to really be a way of increasing that and currently there aren't really any gamified systems that actually measure muscle activity on the core and as I said, there's many studies out there that show that strengthening the core, so not just your abs, but underneath that, the three layers um, below, and also your back muscles can actually help to prevent and reverse uh, back pain. So that's, that's the area. Yeah, and I, I, I love that, that, that when, you, when you wrote that question about the abs, because I think a lot of people do consider, if I've got a, a six pack, or whatever, that that's, that means I'm really fit and healthy, but um, 
yeah, like you almost have this cradle for your spine. It's got to be this whole uh, area. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so the transverse abdominis, which is one of the an other answers on the, the list I gave, uh, that's actually known as the anatomical girdle, which kind of is like a corset that wraps right around the torso. And that's the main, the most, well, can be argued to be the most important for stabilizing your spine and keeping it in an upright posture. So really important to build on that for your strength and for your posture. So I have been hogging you guys um, and even chat to you probably too much in your round. So we have less time than usual for the Q&A, but we've got some questions coming in from the audience. So um, question from uh, Ekaterina uh, wants to know, is mirror therapy a phantom limb effect in reverse? Um, that's interesting. It's actually one of the treatments of phantom limb pain. Um, so phantom limb pain is when someone loses sensation of their limb or if they have a limb amputated and then they imagine they're feeling pain in that limb that's no longer there, that they no longer have sensation in. So often putting the phantom limb or that area of the body into a mirror box can normalize the sensations that come that the, the, the person is perceiving. So they start to then project their healthy side of their body onto the, the affected side, either where the phantom limb is or the affected arm is. And actually it's been really successful in normalizing experiences of phantom limb pain and, and other things like that. Amazing. I I saw I used a kind of mirror thing in uh, uh, Grey's Anatomy, which I, which I loved, if anyone remembers that. Um, uh, oh, I've got quite a nice question from, um, sorry, I pronounced this wrong, Irenia, Irenia. Um, uh, maybe Renee, you take this one. What is your best piece of advice from personal experience for maintaining a good state of mental health? Okay, I'm not gonna, be, this isn't biased because we're actually talking about um, health and fitness, but for me <laughs> personally, I'm really into weightlifting and that's kind of my thing to go to, especially after like a long day at uni or anything mm. stressful. Um, just having an hour or two to really get my mind off things. And also, well, not currently in this current situation, but it's also my social thing as well. Like, mm. I've just wanted to know a lot of people at the moment. It's, yeah, it's, it's a really good uh, stress reliever for me. Um, in the current climate, though, I mean, I haven't really been going to the gym. I'm not comfortable too, so. It's really um, hard. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone's interested, anyone there in the audience interested more about um, sort of general well-being in like winter and winter lockdown, we had a, a really good talk on that uh, the other day, which you can check out on Imperial Lates. Um, I also just want to use um, uh, a couple of minutes for Renera to tell us a bit about, um, you're actually looking for people to get involved, aren't you, with some research that you're doing? Uh, yes, yeah, so actually anyone that does have lower back pain, um, non-specific, I will be perform it well when current climate gets better I will be doing more studies and I'm actually looking to send out a survey just to learn more about people's experience of low back pain um, how they currently deal with it whether current measures are helping what are satisfactory so um, yeah if there, there'll be a link if you are interested just drop me an email and um, I will like to have a discussion to find yeah. out more your opinion Thank you. Yeah, so our um, my colleagues will be posting a link in the in the chat, and so you can contact Renera, find out a bit more, um, anything about back pain. Um, uh, I wanted to spend a bit more time on on the Q and A, but I do have to move on to the other rounds of the quiz. I'm sorry uh, we didn't get to your questions. Um, if you know Michelle or Renera, you want to jump in on the YouTube chat and just start answering things, you're more than welcome. Uh, but um, thank you so much for your time and your expertise, and we'll just see you at the end of the quiz for a little, a little wave goodbye. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to motor on and get into round three, and we're going to get some points. So this is a bit of a fun round. So this is fad or fiction. Now this is about diets. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna present you with 10 diets. Some of them are real diets, they were a diet fad, and some of them are completely made up. So I will give you the name of the diet and the rules for said diet. Now I just want to give you a disclaimer that I do not believe in diets. I do not endorse any of the diets that I'm about to, to describe. Please consult your health professional if you're considering losing weight so that you can do it in a healthy way. 
I would not advise you to get any of these diets and you will see why. So I just need to know, is it fad or is it fiction? 10 questions, one point for each question. So question one, fad or fiction? The juice cleanse. The rule is you are not allowed to eat solids. Question one, I'm just easing you in with this one. That's question one, the juice cleanse. Is it fad or fiction? The rule for this one is you are not allowed to eat solids. Question number two, fat or fiction? The baby food diet. Now the rule for the baby food diet is that you must eat 16 jars of baby food per day instead of regular meals and snacks. That's question two, the baby food diet. The rule for this one is you must eat 16 jars of baby food per day instead of regular meals and snacks. Now, is that a diet fad or is it fiction? Question three, fad or fiction? The scary diet. Now, the rule for this one is you must only eat while you are watching a disgusting horror film. Is that fad? Or is it fiction? So that's number three, the scary diet. The rule being that you must only eat while you are watching a disgusting horror film. Question four, the vision diet. The rule for this one, you must wear blue tinted glasses whenever you eat something. Is that fad or is it fiction? It's question four, the vision diet. Rule for this one, you must wear blue tinted glasses whenever you eat something. Question five, the aversion therapy diet. The rule for this one, every time you eat something, it must be followed with an act of pain. Now, is that fad or is it fiction? Question five, the aversion therapy diet. The rule for this, every time you eat something, it must be followed with an act of pain. To put a little graphic in there for you, just in case you weren't familiar with pain. Fad or fiction? Question six, the avoid swamps diet. The rule for this one is if you live near a swamp, you must move away from it. It's quite a geographical uh, diet. That's question six, is this fad or is it fiction? The avoid swamps diet. The rule is if you live near a swamp, you must move away from it. Number seven, fad or fiction? The cotton ball diet. Rule is here that you must eat up to five cotton balls dipped in juice every day. Fad or fiction? So that's question seven, the cotton ball diet. The rule for this one, you must eat up to five cotton balls dipped in juice every day. Question eight, the tongue patch diet. Rule for this one, you must get a plastic surgeon to sew a patch onto your tongue. I think with these fad or fictions, it's, it's good to think about what's the rationale behind these? Why, why might that be a good diet? if you're struggling with any of these. So question eight, the tongue patch diet, is it fad or fiction? The rule is that you must get a plastic surgeon to sew a patch onto your tongue. Question nine, fad or fiction? The what goes around comes around diet. The rule for this is you must dress or marinate everything you eat 
with your own urine? Question nine, fad or fiction? The what goes around comes around diet. The rule being that you must dress or marinate everything you eat with your own urine. And finally, number 10, the prayer diet. Rule here being, you must pray every day that you will lose weight. Is that fad or fiction? This is question 10, the prayer diet. Rule is, you must pray every day that you will lose weight. Okay, I'm gonna crack on two minutes. See you in two for the answers. Okay, everyone, that's two minutes up. And uh, I have been very, very chatty this evening, which means that I haven't got as much time to give you all of the amazing banter I have for all of these questions. But I'll try and get as much done as I can. Um, the next round is a speed round, so it'll be super quick. So we should still finish around nine. Uh, so the answer is juice cleanse. You are not allowed to eat solids. What do we think, fad or fiction? I can tell you it is a fad, this, this was a thing. Uh, the rationale being that uh, you're prohibited all solid foods, so you eat fewer calories, um, so you just juice it up. You know, the main high calorie things are solid, so, you know, I mean, I suppose you could like blitz it like a steak, but it's not really what people do. Um, great, so one point if you said fad. Uh, the baby food diet, the rule being you must eat 16 jars of baby food per day instead of regular meals and snacks. This is in fact a fad, it's a real diet fad that happened. And that's because it's easy for people to create a calorie deficit apparently. As I said in my disclaimer, I do not support any of these diets. Please do not uh, eat baby food every day. Uh, consult your health, health professional. <laughs> Uh, question three, the scary diet. The rule being you must only eat while you're watching a disgusting horror film. This is, it's fiction, it's not real. I made this one up. Uh, I thought that, you know, maybe some of you would have said it's a fad because really rationale wise, it makes a lot of sense because I feel sick when I watch a scary film. Um, but no, it's not, it's not a diet, it's not a good idea, it's fiction. Question four, the vision diet. Uh, you have to wear blue tinted glasses whenever you eat something. This is true, this is a fad, an actual thing that happened. Um, so uh, people said that red, yellow kind of foods are the most palatable, it's like meat, uh, french fries. And this diet makes food look less appetizing, so you eat less. Um, yeah, bl blue glasses, that's what they say. But yes, fad, a real diet. 
Number five, the aversion therapy diet. So the rule being every time you eat something, it must be followed with an act of pain. Uh, this is fiction. I made this up. Fiction, not a, not a real thing. I mean, aversion therapy is a thing. That's where all of that electroshock therapy came from. Uh, ouch. Um, so that's my basis for my lie about this diet. But no, it's not an actual, it's not an actual thing. Fiction. Number six, the avoid swamps diet. If you live near a swamp, you must move away from it. Uh, strange as it may sound, this is, this was true. This was a fad. Um, this is what I found on it. That uh, in 1727, a guy named Thomas Short observed that, that fat people live near swamps. So he wrote this treaty titled The Cause and Effects of Corpulence and introduced his only logical weight loss tip, which was to move away from the swamp that you live near. That was the 1700s though, but it was a real fad at the time. Uh, number seven, the cotton ball diet. So the rule being you must eat up to five cotton balls dipped in juice every day horribly. This is true, this was a fad. Um, people doing it to fill up their stomachs and it's definitely not, not very safe, but it was a fad, it's a real thing. Uh, number eight, the tongue patch diet. This is getting a plastic surgeon to sew a patch onto your tongue. Would you believe that this was a diet fad? So people basically wanted to make consuming food so painful that you <laughs> had no choice but to have either liquid only or nothing at all. I mean, I think that's insane. So you wanted to get them to put actual stitches uh, in your tongue. Ha, ah, gross. But yeah, real thing, fad. Question nine, what goes around comes around diet. The rule being you must dress or marinate everything you eat in your own urine. Uh, this is not, it's not true. It's not, a, it's not a real diet. I made that one up. Disgusting, but yes, I'm, I, I made that one up. Not a real thing. And number 10, the prayer diet. The rule being that you must pray every day that you will lose weight. Uh, this was on the list of truth. It was a fad. Uh, the rationale being that God helps those who can't help themselves. Um, some people believe that praying uh, subconsciously enables you to eat less food or uh, make healthier choices. Um, so um, that was the answers to the fat or fiction round. So by now you should have uh, three sets of scores for the last three rounds. Uh, they should be out of 11 uh, for the first round, out of 10 for the second round, and out of 10, no, sorry, out of 12 for the second round, and out of 10 for this round. So there'll be a link going in the chat. Uh, you need to click on that, write in your team name at the top and put in your score for round one out of 11, your score for round two out of 12, and your score for round three, the one we just did there, which is out of 10. When you've done that, you will click next, which will take you to the multiple choice options for the speed round. Now you wanna listen closely to this, so yes, uh, you could technically just click a bunch of answers and click send, but you're not gonna do very well. So in the speed round, here are the rules. Every answer that you get right is worth two points. So if you're maybe close to someone, or maybe you wanna take the lead, it's worth listening carefully. Two points. I will only read each question once. So you must listen, I'll only read it once. Then you will have 10 seconds to submit your answers, just 10. And then we're gonna cut it off and you get no points if you're later than those 10 seconds. Some bonus points up for grabs. The first team to submit their answers will get two bonus points. And the second team to submit their answers will get one bonus point. Okay, are we ready? This is it, final push. Remember, it's worth checking. You get two points, worth listening. Here we go. One, two, three. Question one, in fitness, what does HIT stand for? Is it A, healthy innovation in transition? B, healthily increasing internal tiredness? Or C, high intensity interval training? Question two, which type of yoga is practiced in a very warm room? Is it A, Bikram? Is it B, Indian Gasha? Or C, Vinyasha? Question three, which of these coffee shops offers the most caffeinated espresso? Is it A, Starbucks? Is it B, Dunkin' Donuts? Or is it C, McDonald's? 
Question four, new recruits to the armed forces must run two kilometers in what length of time? Is it A, nine minutes? Is it B, 11 minutes? Or is it C, 13 minutes? Question five, sweating is a normal, healthy human thing, but which part of the body has the most sweat glands? Is it A, the lips? Is it B, the back? Or is it C, the feet? Question six, millions of people worldwide get great satisfaction from medical dramas. According to a poll this month, what is the most popular medical drama ever? Is it A, House? Is it B, Grey's Anatomy? Or is it C, ER? Question seven. 2003 American documentary, Super Sized Me, followed a man who committed to eating McDonald's for every meal for a period of 30 days. I want to know how much weight did the man gain? Was it A, 4.3 kilograms, which is 9.5 pounds? Is it B, 7.7 .7 kilograms, which is 17 pounds? Or is it C, 11.1 .1 kilograms, which is 24 pounds? Question eight, what is the world record for days gone without sleep? Is it A, nine days? Is it B, 11 days? Or is it C, 13 days? Question nine, according to the Cleveland Clinic, around 75% of people dream in color, but this is quite a modern thing. What percentage of people dreamt in color before the invention of the color television? Is it A, 8%, is it B, 15%, or is it C, 32%? And finally, question 10, a good number and logic puzzle to exercise our brains is the popular Sudoku, which is typically in a nine by nine grid with uh, numbers one to nine. What is, the what is the name of this variation of Sudoku? Is this A, a samurai? Is it B, Roku Doku? Or is it C, Sudoku Zilla? You now have 10 seconds, go. Okay, everyone, time is up. It's officially up. Stop what you're doing. It's the end. That's it. It's the end of the. It's just. It's the. It's the end of everything. Hope that you got your answers in in time. Um, I'm going to give you the answers. Uh, since you clicked submit. Uh, my colleague has been working away in the background to um, add them up and order them so that we can announce the winner momentarily. But while that is happening, let me put you out of your misery. Question one I asked you in fitness, what does HIT stand for? So I hope that you all got this right. This is high intensity interval training. So that's where people alternate short periods of intense activity, um, uh, which can be good for improving cardiovascular fitness. Um, so some people swear by it. Uh, question two, I want to know which type of yoga is practiced in a very warm room? So the answer to this is Bikram yoga. Uh, so Bikram, yeah, it's in like a sauna-like room uh, at about 40% humidity. Uh, the one I gave you there, Iyengasha, uh, I made that one up. That's not, it's not even a, it's not even a term. And uh, C, vinyasa is, uh, is a type of yoga, uh, but just not the right answer. That's considered to be the most athletic yoga style. Uh, so question three, I want to know which of these coffee shops offered the most caffeinated espresso? I can tell you that the answer is uh, Starbucks. Um, so uh, the, the information online for this is judged by milligrams of caffe caffeine per ounce. So McDonald's uh, is 9.1 milligrams per ounce. Dunkin' Donuts, 15 milligrams per ounce. But Starbucks way up there with 20.6 milligrams per ounce. So bang for your buck if you really want the caffeine, uh, go for Starbucks, but not for lots of other reasons. Question four, new recruits uh, to the armed forces must run two kilometers in what length of time? So the answer to this is 11 minutes. So exactly, it's uh, it's 11 minutes and 15 seconds. 
uh, and this is to meet the entry requirements, although some roles do require faster times. So it's designed to just test their aerobic fitness levels. 11 minutes. Question five, I, uh, I asked you which part of the body has the most sweat glands? So while you might think that you're sweating most from your back, it's in fact your feet have the most sweat glands. They have over 250,000 sweat glands. Um, your back does have a lot, but not as many as that. And your lips actually have no sweat glands at all. You don't sweat from your lips. Uh, not the lips, not, not, not here, but you know, upper lip, sure. Uh, other places you do not have sweat glands are your nails and your ears. No sweat glands in there. No need to put deodorant on those. Uh, oh yes, question six. So uh, I didn't quite agree with this answer, but that's what the polls say, that the most popular medical drama ever, according to the general public, is House. I mean, I do like House, um, but my personal favorite is Grey's Anatomy. Uh, I don't know what everyone thinks there in the chat. Do you agree? Do you agree? I mean, yes, House is very good, but Grey's Anatomy just does it. It just does it for me, and I can't wait for the next series to come out. Uh, question seven. This documentary was nuts, uh, and this guy, he did gain all of these amounts of weight with C, 11.1 kilograms being what he gained at the end of the 30 days. So uh, after five days, he gained 4.3 kilos. After 11 days, he had gained 7.7 .7 kilos. But by 30 days, he had gained 11.1. .1. And it took him nine months to lose the weight that he put on in those 30 days. Uh, question eight, what was the world record for days gone without sleep? Do not recommend you try this at home. Uh, the record is 11 days, and this record is held by 17-year-old American Randy Gardner. Uh, on the 11th day of his without sleep, he was asked to subtract seven repeatedly from 100, and he stopped at 65. And when he was asked why he had stopped, he said, that he'd forgotten what he was doing. And that was about time to go to sleep, they thought. 11 days. Question nine, according to the Cleveland Clinic, around 75% of people now dream in color. But I wanted to know before the invention of the color television, how many people dreamt in color? So it's only 15%, only 15% of people dreamt in color before the invention of the color television which is kind of, it's kind of crazy because, you know, life is generally in color. Uh, it didn't just happen through the television, but 15% anyway. It's one of those crazy facts about sleep that I found. There's lots of other interesting facts about sleep. I suggest you look them up. Uh, and question 10, um, I wanted to know what the name of this Sudoku variation is. And this is a samurai Sudoku. Uh, with five interwoven grids. You have to kind of sol solve them simultaneously. Um, uh, the other ones are actually types of Sudoku. I didn't just make them up. So the Roku Doku is six uh, two by three rectangles. And the Sudoku Zilla, which sounds made up, is 100 10 by 10s. I've never tried one of those and I don't particularly uh, intend to. Um, I'm just going to check with my team in the background if we're ready to tell you who the winner is. So if you just give me a moment. Um, okay, it looks like we're ready to go. So, uh, yep, time for the final scores. So let's um, bring up what we've got here. Oh, yes. Okay, now I'm half blind. So let's just zoom. Fantastic. All right. So, no, a bit more. Going to need to zoom in there bit more of the zoomings. I don't know how we do that. <laughs> um, or I'll just have a little guess. So, oh, here we go. All right, R times three. Uh, great, so is, that, uh, is this you're in first or last? Oh, I'm so sorry, R times three, you're in last. You're in last place. Um, uh, and in first place, we have Live in La Vida Lockdown with 41 points. So let's just scroll up to the top there. Let's just see what the difference is. That's 41, 
for living la vie die lockdown and 23 i mean good effort you know so that's thank you to um to all of the teams we've got some great names here uh the supers the kgb's bearded dragons overqualified underperforming ouch uh don't be too hard on yourselves um chunky brains Let's see if it was oh, i guess i guess the people with the high scores were consistently sort of I threw out it, were they? Yeah, I mean, well done. Um, it would be interesting to know uh, how many people were in each team, actually. Um, because, you know, sometimes that can be an unfair an unfair advantage. Uh, I mean, I don't know if Felicia is a, is, is a solo human, but you did very well there to get 29 uh, just by yourself. Uh, thank you. So, yes, there is no prize, but congratulations to Live in La Vida Lockdown. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining the quiz tonight. It's been, um, I hope it's been at least half as good for you as it has been for me. Um, I get great enjoyment out of uh, collaborating with the researchers from Imperial and also making up some fun things about uh, health and fitness. So, these, we say goodbye to our lovely researchers. Thank you, Renera. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm just going to tell you a tiny bit about what's happening next just before you uh, head off to, I don't know, bed or the last, I don't know, 45 minutes of the pub before it closes. So our next Imperial Lates, which will be the last one of the year, will center around food. And this is one of my favorite uh, topics. It's going to be called Food for Thought. And that's in just a few weeks, which starts on Monday, the 30th of November and ends with another awesome quiz written and hosted by me on the 3rd of December. There will definitely be some kind of festive element to the quiz because I love Christmas. So I will be dressing up. I suggest that you also do that as well. You can check out more details if you go to imperial.ac.uk forward slash what's on, uh, or you can follow us on Twitter at Imperial Spark. So do sign up for the next one. Um, yes, great comments. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, you know, tell your friends, um, you know, the more competition, the better. Thumbs up from people. So share what you've learned. Laugh about what you didn't know. Thank you and goodbye.